is how can we, as Catholics, understand a, a, a Catholic way of thinking and present a Catholic way of thinking in the environments in which we naturally move. And so some of us are business people, some of us are lawyers, some of us are doctors and scientists, some of us are the arts. And so we thought we would look at the classical transcendentals, the one, that, the true, the good, the beautiful, and we end with unity, as a way of understanding a kind of a classical mindset of what these transcendentals are, because understanding the transcendentals lead us to contemplation, and contemplation leads to virtue. And so tonight, I'm just thrilled that we're going to be speaking. I've lost the phone, but that's okay. Because I drove in for an hour with Henry. Um, Henry's sort of my neighbor, and some of you may know I moved far out west in the diocese, and Henry lives there with his wife Mary and their seven kids, uh, all of whom are home, uh, and uh, six of whom or five of whom are anxious to prepare for exams tomorrow at school, so please keep them in your prayers. Uh, Henry has a very lively and active home. Uh, Henry actually began his education, he, although he had great artistic instinct as a young man, um, he ended up at the Naval Academy, oh. where he learned how to fly. <laughs> where uh, where he did excellent work, and then ended up flying F-14s out of Pensacola. So I figured it was when he told me what he needed for computer support. I figured if the guy can fly an F-14, this is the way. <laughs> but after he finished his six years of service, he really felt an attraction to the arts. He, as, as a young child already. His parents had no idea of proclivity for drawing and for artistic precision. And he never really let go of that completely, but it was sort of off to the side while he was pursuing his education and going through the first round of his career. And uh, as he left the military, which he entered more or less at his father's suggestion, uh, he found something called the Atelier, which was also at his father's suggestion. Um, the atelier is a kind of a classical way of learning the arts. Rather than going to academy where you get grades, it's basically hands-on studio work where you're directed by a master of the craft, and you learn that you learn how to master your art from a master. So that's what he did. He studied with Ing, uh, Ing, Ingridson. Paul Ingridson up in uh, he was in Boston and moved in, ultimately to, to, Man to Manchester, but. In the process of, of that, he actually spent some time in Fiorense, where he worked with an artist named Cecil. And it was there, it's a combination of his work at the Boston School and the Florence School that Henry has perfected his own technique. So when we, Henry and I first started speaking about what, what we were talking about, we were kind of batting around ideas, and we came up with the title of his talk as A Vision of Glory art as a pathway to the good and to God. And so he's here tonight to speak to us about goodness, beauty as a path to goodness, and beauty as a pathway to God. And I'm sure you will join me in welcoming him warmly. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for being here. I know you could be out shopping for Christmas, <laughs> but I'm glad you're here. Um, I'm thrilled to, um, to be an artist, to be able to draw and paint um, as a profession. Um, I also like to talk about art, so I'm glad to be here. And thank you for inviting me. Thank you, David. And thank you, Fathers. Did Father Rampino have to leave, I think? Yes, I okay, so. Um, but thank you very much for having me. Um, oh, can we, can we start with a prayer? A good way to start, I think. So, in the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you for your glorious creation. You are the supreme artist. We thank you for the gift of creativity and of art. We ask that you continue to bless us, our families, and our country. Please bless our time here tonight. Mother Mary, Our Lady, Please pray for us. Especially, please pray that we be given wisdom and grateful, sensitive hearts. We pray in our Lord Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, so um, I wanted to.
tell you a little bit about um, my training, which I find interesting. I started talking a little bit about it tonight. Um, this link back to pre-modern art, show you some of my favorite works of art to start with that are really powerful, I think. And then um, end with the idea that David uh, mentioned about um, seeing the natural world and having that lead us to goodness and to, and to God. And actually, I was going to use the poetry of Gerard Manley Hopkins to wrap things up because he does that so well. I'm sure a lot of you know about Hopkins and how he'll see something in nature and that'll lead him to praise in other words. So, so first of all, I'll talk about uh, something like this. Uh, of course, Michelangelo's um, Creation of Adam, this wonderful painting, and I think one of the best paintings ever done in the Sistine Chapel ceiling than this jewel of that whole ceiling, the Creation of Adam. Uh, I think Michelangelo is one of my favorite favorite artist. Um, I love the powerful uh, figures. I just love to, to paint uh, muscles. You know, I, I like to teach our children about great art, so I'll hold up pictures and, um, and they have to guess who they are. And so I say, whenever there's lots of muscles, it's got to be Michelangelo. <laughs> <laughs> so even our little you know, seven-year-old will sing out, Michelangelo, if he sees <laughs> muscles. Um, and this, this um, great, talk about muscles again, uh, Hellenistic sculpture. Uh, my, fa my four favorite periods of art are the Hellenistic um, period, the, uh, the 331 BC, and the Greek sculptors were just phenomenal. And this, this type of ability wasn't reached again until Michelangelo and maybe Bernini, you know, in the Renaissance and Baroque. So this is in the Uffizi, but just so beautiful, so graceful and strong. I think that combination um, is what makes it so great. And then the Winged Victory, another Hellenistic sculpture in the Louvre. You probably know this. Um, again, just beautiful, wonderful anatomy, movement. It's hard to get movement in art, um, especially if you have a model that you have there posing in front of you trying to portray it. You want that model to stay still so you can, so you can see the figure and, and paint it or sculpt it accurately. But at the same time, you want movement to make the thing look alive. And so somebody like this artist gets the, that sort of windswept look. <coughs> and then, of course, the David. I, I got the, had the pleasure of seeing the David just this past summer. Um, I'd seen it a handful of times before, but it was as striking as ever, if not more so. So I remember. Almost it was a sort of religious experience almost seeing this beautiful work of art. Um, so a lot of you have seen it, I bet. And it's in that wonderful museum with the skylight, so it's lit perfectly. It's up on a pedestal above people's eye level, so you come in and look down the hallway at the David, and there could be thousand people in there, but you see him above their heads. So it's really set wonderfully. So I think the David and the and that winged victory in the Louvre are really my two favorite works of art. I think they're displayed, most powerful and displayed the best of all. Um, and, then, and then Titian, the painter, this is in Venice, the Assumption. I'm talking about, see the movement in, the, in Mary's, which looks like she's twisting around and the cloth is, is spinning. Um, yeah, he had a model that he was painting from, you know, holding very still, so it's really, a, you know, great feat to uh, be able to do that. So these are among my favorites, and I think the most powerful uh, works of art. And close up. Then it's another it's a Titian portrait. I started off doing portraiture uh, mostly, and then have gotten into doing uh, religious painting as well. But I really love portraiture, and Titian's one of my favorites. And I'll talk more about a little bit later about. Um, the visual order, so that's sort of the most sophisticated um, aspect of the training I receive, and now what I teach um, is trying to duplicate the visual order. So when you're looking at a model that you set up in, in this natural light, a single light source, you have a, a light side and a dark side, the shadow, that's what gives it the three dimensionality. You know, that canvas is perfectly flat, you know, flat as a sheet of paper, but it's the sh shading, the shadow, that gives it the illusion of three dimensionality. So that's, Leonardo da Vinci said that the artist that should be um, praised the most 
uh, is he who can make the thing look the most three-dimensional. Mm. So, so this idea of, of the visual order, what comes to your eye uh, right away, you know, the, the, the left side of his face and then the white V, long, narrow V, especially the right side where it's sharper, high contrast, that, that really comes to your eye right away. Things like you know, the shadow right above his, his left shoulder, his hair blending into the dark, those things are called losts and they just blend into the background. And you want a combination of the two because that's the way our, the real world works. If we can't make out something dark, a shadow underneath something, it doesn't bother us, our minds are quick enough to, to make it out, we're used to that. So if you can duplicate that in art, you get a sense, a real sense of um, realism and naturalism. Okay, so somebody like Titian really understood that. So the losts and founds, and that combination makes it very um, sort of believable and naturalistic. <coughs> and then look, look, at this, look at this face. This is just an mm. amazing portrait of this man. This is in the London, London, London of a Van Dyke in the 1600s. He's a Baroque painter in the 1600s. Really understood that idea about the visual order. And so, uh, they're just phenomenal, I think, painting. It's the moisture in his eyes, they look so real. And that's what I love about portraiture. It's the real sense of realism, but also sense of the humanity. You know, you feel like you could talk to this man or get to know him. Um, very, very, this is sort of the height, in my opinion, the height of portraiture, somebody like Van Dyke. All right, then moving ahead. So I started to mention my favorite, so the, the um, the Hellenistic period, the Greek, it was mostly sculpture um, before in the BC, and then second favorite, or second, no, I don't know if I ranked them, but my, my second one is the Renaissance, 1400s, 1500s, and then the Baroque period, which is uh, people like Van Dyke, we just saw, and the fourth is the um, 19th century, people like John Singer Sargent, an American artist, but he spent most of his time in Europe and could paint a portrait like this. So real, real highlights of art. So John Singer Sargent, this is Sargent also painting of Henry James. And then a self-portrait um, by Sargent. And again, you notice the, the, the light coming from one side, the shadow on the other side. A little bit of light hitting, <coughs> hitting on the left, his right, to get the light on the eye. But that's all set up with, in the studio with natural light. And so he, he would just try, you're looking in the mirror, of course, for the self-portrait, he would try different poses until they had just the right amount of light hitting his right side. So I want to paint that. And that idea of the visual, the, for the visual order, things coming to your eye, he just tries to duplicate that on his canvas. And you end up with something really you know, stunning like this. This is also Sargent, Carnation Lily, Lily, Lily Rose, it's called, and a really wonderful painting. Apparently he would paint only about 20 minutes a day on this. Took him a couple of years, a couple of summers, when that, that 20 minutes of kind of golden light at the end of the day. So apparently he'd be playing tennis, waiting for the time. <laughs> the <laughs> the Great outfit. So he's, he's like, okay, we're ready. <laughs> we go pose and he'd paint for 20 minutes and then, then they'd wait for the next day. But really beautiful. I saw, I got to see this. He came to Washington. It's usually in London. But a number of years ago, they had a big sergeant show, and this was in, in Washington. I remember walking into the room, and I thought, they must have a bank of lights behind that canvas shining through it. It's so luminous. Yeah. Like a really, really, so beautiful. Okay, then, then um, Dennis Miller Bunker is another American, similar to Sargent. You see his, his years. He only lived to be 29 years old, unfortunately. Some people thought he would, he was, uh, he would compete with Sargent. Um, and maybe even surpass him, but unfortunately he didn't live very long. But that idea of the lost and founds, the visual order, you know, really the front of her face, that profile so sharp and easily seen versus the sort of black on black dress or up under her chin, um, more of the lost. All right, and I, and I want to talk about the Boston School because my training, as David mentioned, um, has a link back to the Boston School. Um, and all this training, all this training is very important um, to be able to say something 
with your art. So there are really two kind of two fundamentals, I think. There's the training that you, you have to get the craft, the, just the ability, just like learning to play the piano. It takes years and years and years with a good teacher to practice, practice. The painting is the same way. You can train your eye to see well, things like that, the visual order, um, seeing color well. This, I didn't know there's so much to it, but um, it really takes, takes years to train your eye to learn the craft. Of course, there's color mixing and seeing colors. That's, that's a difficulty. I remember Paul Ingrid, so my teacher, saying, you come and give a critique, and you say, well, your colors are all off. I said, gosh, they look good to me. <laughs> <laughs> They're dull. You know, uh, one of the hard things is seeing color in the shadows. He would say, the strength of a painting comes from the color in the darks, which is pretty interesting. Let's go back to, um, let's go back to this. See the, <laughs> see, the, see the shadow on his face? Mm -hmm. you know, it's not just gray or black, it's really rich, mm -hmm. reddish brown. There's a lot of kind of glowing, <laughs> glowing color in there, even down his neck. Um, so that, kind of the little shadow up under his hair, you know, it's kind of reddish brown. So there's a lot of color in there that gives it the life. You know, a, a, a sort of an amateurish painter will paint shadows just dark, black, gray, and it just, you know, looks dead. It's dull. So that took a long time. As you start seeing the color better and better um, over the years. I was saying to David that my that Ingridson used to say that he thought his women um, students saw color better or learned to see the color better quicker than his men. He thought maybe it had to do with just growing up as girls, wondering what went well with other, you know, the clothing. They were just more interested in, in the color. <coughs> So the Boston School is a school of artists um, centered around Boston around the late 19th century, early 20th century, and um, really excellent painters. A lot of them, most of them studied in Europe, mostly in Paris. Um, this is by Joseph de Camp. This is also by Joseph de Camp, his daughter. Um, but they understood that all that I really love about painting, good, accurate drawing, so sort of academic drawing is really accurate. Um, and you can train your eye to see, you know, angles and shapes and proportions well. It just takes a long time. Um, and then um, the Impressionists in France were, were starting to paint outside and, and with brighter colors, really interested in the light, light effects, like Monet painting the haystacks or the cathedral, you know, I don't know, 15 times in different atmospheres, different lighting. So they're really interested in the light. So that was influencing these Boston school painters. So they're really interested in the academic drawing, really accurate great color, um, and, but then also painting outside and being more, um, more colorful. And then somebody like Sargent, maybe a little less finished. You know, remember that, that portrait by Van Dyke, really finished. Almost to the point where he's doing individual hairs on that little mm -hmm. goatee. Sargent would never do that. Um, let's go back to Sargent. You know, he's a big swath of of color in the beard to represent, to, you know, a chunk of beard. Um, so different amounts of finish. And I guess the impression, the impressionists were quite unfinished. They influenced a lot of these, a lot of these painters. So the Boston School became very important to me because um, my teacher's teacher was trained by the Boston School. Um, this is this is DeCamp, portrait of President Roosevelt by DeCamp. Now here's just a little example of, of the lost and found or the importance of shadows. See how sharp, you know, a lot of things are very sharp, like his pants leg, the table, mm -hmm. as opposed to the shadows against the wall. You know, it gives a great, gives a great depth. You, know, you feel like that's a shadow in the background um, as opposed to his, his legs being up there in front. So that's a flat canvas, you know, mm -hmm. perfectly flat. So it's, it's really one of the things. I love this portrait. This is. Uh, Edmund Tarvel, another Boston School painter. But see how round that head is? It's a really three-dimensional. That's what the Boston School could do. And they, and then William Paxton, another, another one. They passed that on to this man, Ives Gamble. He's the one that taught my two teachers. So Gamble was born in 1893, learned from Paxton and Tarvel in Boston. Then he saw what was happening with modern art in the 
early 1900s. 1913 was the Armory Show in New York City. A lot of modern art from Europe was brought over for the first time. So that's sort of a watershed year for modern art starting to take over. So these Boston school painters, you know, they lived into Sargent lived into the 1920s. Um, some lived into the into the 30s and 40s even. But um, but Gann was a little younger. He lived until 1981. So he made it. He saw what was happening with this art and the art training, and decided to make it his life's work to keep alive what he had been taught. So, um, so he taught until, pretty much until his death, right? I think he stopped maybe 1980, died in 81. So my two teachers studied with him in the 1970s. Mm -hmm. So like David said, I was in the Navy. I went into the Navy because I couldn't find a traditional art school when I was getting out of high school in the 80s in Charlottesville. I grew up in Charlottesville, Virginia. Mm -hmm. I went to UVA and William and Mary and um, Washington Lee. And I was most interested in art. But their programs are all modern. I, I really didn't like modern art. I didn't want to <clears throat> spend my time doing that. So, so I got into the Naval Academy. I was doing that application process. I got in. I thought, well, I'll try it. And I liked it, so I stayed. And I'd be in the Navy, and I chose flight. And I, before I knew, I was flying F-14. And so, it was, it was a real teacher. <laughs> um, it, it did. It did uh, introduce me to Italy for the first time. Um, I was on the aircraft carrier the Kennedy. And we were in the Adriatic in the early 90s because of Yugoslavia was a, was a hot spot at that point. Yep. And so we pulled into Trieste up in northern, the northern Adriatic. And uh, I got to go to Venice for the first time and Florence. And so I was just introduced to those wonderful cities for the first time. And I always had this art interest in the back of my mind. And I knew I didn't want to be in the Navy for a career. I just wanted to do it for a short period. And uh, so I was getting out. I was 28 years old thinking, well, what am I going to do now? I thought maybe teach history, maybe, maybe medical school, maybe architecture, that's artistic. But I didn't think painting was really feasible. I thought it was you know, too hard to make a living at it. But then my father did discover these ateliers, or a handful of them, three or four or five. I went and looked at one in Florida, went, to, went up and met Ingridson in Boston. As soon as I went into his studio, it was an old factory. All you, all you need in one of these is, is a north facing window because mm. you want ambient light. You don't want the sunlight to shine in. So in the southern hemisphere, you want south-facing window. So I walked in there. It's dark. And it takes a while for your eyes to adjust. You got this soft light coming in from these windows, and these students, real quietly, just looking at their setup, walking back and forth, and drawing or painting. And the, the results were, were amazing because you get the, the light side, the dark sides of everything. It's really three-dimensional. You start by doing cast drawing, these plaster casts of famous statues. They stay really nice and still. And they're white, <laughs> and you don't have to pay them um, like a live model. And they're just, they're, and, they, and they're simple. So you start by drawing charcoal um, busts of cat, casts, and, and then you move on to live models, a lot of figure drawing, and then still life painting. Um, but this takes years. So I spent five years with Ingridson. I initially did four years, thought that was enough. You don't, you don't get a diploma, there's no graduation, you just stay as long <laughs> as you think. So I spent four years, uh, okay, I'm ready. I went back to Virginia, lived with my parents, I was still single, and, um, and I rented a little room as a studio. I thought, you know, I tried to get, I got a commission to paint a deceased person, so I had to use a photograph. Already it wasn't what I wanted, because I don't like to use photographs, I like to use live models. But pretty much right away I knew I'm just not good enough yet to do this. So then I thought, well, there's this other, other teacher in Florence, Italy, who studied with Gamble in the 70s, went to Florence in, in the early 80s, has been there ever since. He's still teaching there. Um, and so when I went and spent a term with him, I think in 99, and now I made a real, real jump at that point. I think just living in Florence, good competition. There are about maybe 30 students, a lot of English students. There's only one Italian, a handful of Americans. It was all done in English, so unfortunately I never was forced to learn Italian, but I just loved living there. It felt pretty great to, um, you know, to walk through Florence to the studio and see all these tourists are there for you know, maybe three days to see all the sights. I mean, I'm up there for you know, four months. Well, I live here. Um, but just being there was really wonderful. And the competition was good, so I made a real leap. But um, doing that, while I was there, I realized that, uh, that Ingridson really, in a way, knew more or knew um, do a different different 
different, a little bit different teaching methods. I felt I needed to spend more time with Ingbertson. Um, so I went back for a fifth year to Ingbertson, and then um, and by that time I had met my future wife, and I wanted her to experience Italy, so then we went back for another time, back to Cecil, and lived there together, newly married, which is really wonderful too. So then, after that, it was 2002, I started professionally, and been doing it ever since. Um, so actually, I was just thinking that next September, I started in September of 94, my series training, full-time. So this coming September, 2024, will be 30 years of full-time art. So, and I just love it. Um, a kind of happy occurrence is, is that our oldest is 21, Agnes, and she's decided to, um, to pursue art. So in fact, in a few weeks, she's going to Florence to study with Cecil, you know, the teacher that I studied with 25 years ago. He's still at it, and uh, she's, she already spent one term last spring with him, and she's doing really well. Um, I think she's better than I was at her stage. Plus, I was 28 when I started, she's 21. Um, I guess she started when she was 20. So I, it made me more interested in people like Raphael, the, the great artist Raphael. Apparently his father is a painter. You never hear anything about Raphael's father. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm hoping that I'll be like that. <laughs> She'll really zoom past me. I think that's what we need, you know, generation after generation of, uh, of this passed down. I think that's what happened in the Renaissance, in the Baroque period. And we'll get we'll, we'll get a, a new little renaissance of, of art, hopefully. So let's see. So Gamel, I'm so happy or so you know grateful to him that he passed on what he knew to Ingbertson and Cecil. Um, this is Ingbertson, a little it's a blurry photograph, but you see how beautifully he can paint a head. Um, you know, just it's just beautiful. Beautifully painted. And then Cecil in Florence. Cecil's more influenced by the old masters in Italy. His palette is more somber, more subdued than Ingridson. So I'm sure I feel like I'm somewhere in between the two. You know, I, I subdued my color a little bit after going to Florence. Okay, and then this is this is a portrait of mine. Um, but that same idea of the light, you know, a little bit of light hitting her right in the cheek, mm -hmm. the highlights in the eyes, that's all coming from a natural, natural light. So my studio that I built down in Madison um, has a big north-facing window and some curtains so you can adjust it to let less light in or more light in. So this is my, my brother's wife. Painted her when they were engaged, so they wanted to feature her engagement ring. But actually, it's, um, I was talking about the, the, the lively color. I think I got the lively color in her face, but not in her hand. See how her hand is mm -hmm. you know, it's a little bit too dull, too gray? Doesn't look very alive. Mm -hmm. I didn't do that on purpose. I did. <laughs> 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 it's much, you know, much more lifelike. And another thing about this painting, I remember Ingridson used to say, "Tell us when we were working from the model, um, if the clo you know, clothing could change, fall differently, hair, especially in a girl's model, the hair would change." And he would come and give us a critique, and he said, "Well, yesterday it was it was like my painting. I promise." And well, today it's different. They say, well, chase it. Meaning change it. Change it what it looks like now. And that's so frustrating. But, it, but it's, it, was, it was good, and I follow that now. And what he meant was just be willing to make a change if it's better. And just be approached as a malleable process. If you're going to work with this model for maybe three weeks, three hours a day. Um, and you'll see a lot of little different changes. You'll, I mean, the first day, you'll, or first or second day, you'll set the pose and then try to get back into it the same way. But little things will change, like the hair especially. So one day with Bethany, that little bit of hair over here on our left was a little bit further forward and the sunlight hit it. And I thought, oh, that's great. You know, it livens up that side. So, I, so I, I painted that. And then before it was back and in the shadow. So that's a little example of this, this working from life. Yes? Well, how long did it take you to paint this? Um, it could have been 30 hours, maybe 25, 30 hours. So usually three hour sessions are kind of ideal. The, the model, after that, you start getting really tired. Mm -hmm. um, so she would pose for about, actually I think I have a picture of me working with her. So she would pose there, 
um, for about 25 minutes. If you're seated, it's easier. And some people can sit longer. So maybe, you know, sometimes people sit for, for 30, 40 minutes, but then take a five or 10 minute break, which you'll get up and walk around, and I'll sit down, right? Because I work standing. Because you walk back and forth. So I would, I'm up there painting with the easel close to her, but my viewing distance is way back, about maybe 10 yeah. feet or so. In fact, Leonardo da Vinci said the best viewing distance from any work of art is three times its greatest dimension. Oh. So if that's three feet tall, then three times that, nine feet would be back. And that's sort of a natural thing. You go to a museum, you see a big painting, you just want to stand back and mm -hmm. sort of take it all in. And then you might go up and look at detail, which is interesting, but just that natural set. So when I work on something, it's good to um, view it from a distance. You see, you see it better, you see the whole thing better. It also helps because you don't get caught up in the detail. Getting caught up in detail is kind of a bad thing. You want to do the, the big things first and, mm -hmm. and detail only later. All right, here's, a, here's another portrait of mine in the studio. You can see the sitter on the left and the canvas on the right. So, you, so a lot of the artistic part of it is in the setup. Because once you set it up, then I'm just trying to use that craft I was talking about to duplicate it with that visual order and the great color, interesting composition. Um, so this is a man named Mr. Opie down in Stanton. That paper is the ledger, I think it's called. It was his family that had started that years ago. Um, so he wanted a newspaper in his hand, his UVA class ring on. I think he's not wearing it in the photograph, but you see it in the painting. Like in a and the and the um, Lions Club maybe or something club with a little pin. But but so he wants these little details. Oh, and, and his book collection. He even brought some of his own books. So <laughs> he liked that library scene. In fact, the painting is in the is in the Woodrow Wilson um, library in Stanton. Oh, so right. I thought the library scene was appropriate for that. Mm -hmm. I think one of my better portraits. And again, the same thing with the sh with the with the light and the shadow. Right, this is a portrait I did in Florence of a British boy. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I like I like this one. This one, unfortunately, sold without me really wanting to sell it. Early on in my career, after I did this in Florence mm -hmm. on my first trip, I brought it back, and I was entering entering competitions because I was trying to get my name mm -hmm. out there. And I sent this to a show in Kansas City. I think they had a good realistic show each year. So I sent it out there and he asked for what the price was and I didn't expect it to sell. So I put something on there and lo and behold, the, the thing sold and never came back to me. So I miss it. And this is a commission portrait of Judge Young in Richmond. He, um, I, I admired his bow tie. One of the nice things about portraiture is you get to spend, and working for life, you get to spend a amount of time, good amount of time with them. So, you know, this is probably even longer than 30 hours because it's full length. So he stood there, so it's a little bit longer. Hands take a long time. Um, so I got to know Judge Tice a little bit and enjoyed his company and, and admired his bow tie and said something about how I liked it. And he said, well, I'll tell you what, I'll give it to you if you wear it to the unveiling. <laughs> so I wore his bow tie to the unveiling. Very cute. I still have it, I wore it every day. I then a, a picture of the girl. Remember, remember the, the lost and found, the, the shadow under the mm -hmm. chin of the, um, the Dennis Miller Bunker portrait in profile, a really great portrait, the girl with the long neck. Um, so it's trying to, trying to do that, show the lost and the found, and these soft, soft hair versus sharp clothing against skin. So that lost and found that um, is a big aspect. I mean, this is a painting I did of St. Therese uh, um, for the Human Life International Chapel out in Front Royal. Mm. The priest there asked me to do this, commissioned me to do this, and he had the great idea of make it look like uh, St. Therese is handing the viewer a rose. So I really like that, that idea. Now, this is a little bit interesting because, of course, we all know what St. Therese looks like because they had photographs of her. Mm -hmm. um, so usually I'd work, just work from life. And, and the model be there, and I'm just trying to duplicate what I see. Set it up beautifully, good light, good shadow, good clothing. But in this case, I had the photograph, I had to make it look like her. So I had a black and white photograph, that I had a model with good coloring and good hands, very nice hands. Mm. 
and I got the I got the outfit from uh, through a connection. My brother's wife's sister is in Carmelite in Brooklyn, and she got me a whole set of the habit for the couple of months. So I had my model pose in the right habit, real flowers. So that's how I painted this this picture. So a lot of piecing together, a lot of kind of problem solving. And I do still life, this is still life painting also. Same idea, single light source, trying to make things look round, trying to do good color. Just celebrating the natural world, David mentioned. Uh, and then the, that idea about atmosphere, um, you know, it's, again, it's a flat canvas, it's just paint. But with the shadows and the soft edges, you're trying to make it look like there's atmosphere. Oh, oh, uh, the word breadth, is a good word for a painting that has has atmosphere, or has a sense of unity and real life. So I think this has an atmosphere. It feels like you could reach in and pick up the bottle that you might bump over the pitcher in doing so. If you move the knife, it'd fall off the edge. So it's all all flat, all done with, with shading. Okay, so then I have done some religious paintings. This is one of the ones at St. John's that Father Hathaway commissioned. Um, so this is the visitation. And, I, and I, again, I get to paint the faces or paint the old figures, which I like, but with the, with the old story behind it. Of, um, you know, the Bible story that it's trying to depict. So I, I really, I guess I enjoyed this even more than doing the portrait, because there's more to it, trying to put together the whole picture. And a lot of it has to do with, the, with what you're given. You know, you want to get a, a, a tall, vertical space. You know, big vertical paintings, more fitting for a figure than a horizontal, so a landscape. I did do a series of, of paintings for St. Mary's, old St. Mary's in, near Chinatown in DC, the five Georgian mysteries, for niches underneath the stained glass windows. Unfortunately, they were, I think, six feet wide and five feet tall, so landscape. And so I was trying to do these figures. It's my most awkward, most awkward paintings. You know, it, you know they were squished in there and they're five feet. I didn't bring any slides of that. <laughs> <laughs> I like this. This is eight and a half feet tall, so you're almost life size. Just feels better. And this is I did for Father DeSales at St. Raymond of Pettifor. So this is St. Raymond on his miraculous voyage. But I never heard of that. It's a great story. He was in my on Mallorca on the island. Um, St. Raymond, I guess, was brilliant. He's 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 the third head of the Dominican order. And he was an advisor to a king, and the king was in Mallorca, and he was, I think he had a mistress there, and so the saint was telling him, I'm leaving if you don't stop doing this. And the king said, no. He said, well, I'm, then I'm leaving. But then the king said, told all the ship captains, don't take him. Which I find funny, because don't they say that Mallorca and Ibiza are the party capitals of Europe? It was you know, 600 years ago, too. Um, so, um, Oh, so the saint went down to the shore and said, well, I am leaving. And he got on his cloak and tied his staff and he sailed, pair sailed, or no, windsurfed. <laughs> Should have been a name was all the way to Barcelona, 180 miles. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what this, I guess this is, zoom, this is zoomed in. You can see the water beneath him. But a great, a great project. This is in, in St. Raymond. It's big, he's, he's six feet tall. I think it's a nine foot tall canvas. Yeah. I do drawings beforehand. This was a, a this became a painting of uh, Saint Joseph of Jesus in the woodworking shop. So I do drawings first. You have to work out everything beforehand, and then only once you have everything worked out, then paint it. This is I finished with this. I'm probably going on too long. Um, but this is for Oak Crest School in Vienna, their new building, really beautiful school. And they asked me to do the, <clears throat> the big painting from behind the tabernacle. Mm -hmm. So I worked with the headmistress and the lady in charge of beautifying the chapel. Have any of you seen that school? It's very, very nice. And the chapel's right in the center, and that's very, very nice. Um, and so they wanted the nativity scene. Um, and so this is a drawing to give them ideas of shape and size. They had this niche. I had the idea, and the tabernacle's there on the on the small altar. I had the idea of the wainscoting 
and the two angels down below. They didn't take that, which I think they should still. Um, <laughs> the adorned angels, and then the, the nativity above. And so this is a drawing I did. I got a good model. This is my niece. I thought it was a good model for, for Mary. Mm -hmm. And I wanted a real connection. Oh, because it's all girls' school. Um, I wanted a real connection with the baby. So I like this drawing. Uh, and then so I did a full size, worked out the composition in a small scale, did a full size charcoal drawing. So this is, this is big. It's, I think it's maybe seven feet across and nine feet tall. Mm. That middle beam, the dark beam behind the drawing went away. So you'll see that, that they removed that. But it fits his face very nicely. And I think the crucifix overlapping the bottom of the painting is good. So a lot of work in, in composition, working out the, the size of the frame, where it's going to go, mimicking the arch. And so then, then so they approved that. Then this is a start of the canvas with Mary's face, Joseph, a little tiny bit there, and then a the, the close up of Mary and Jesus and Joseph. They wanted a young Joseph. It was, it was kind of fun. It drove my wife crazy. I'd come home and say, well, I talked to the two ladies from Oakcrest today, and they want earrings on Mary. And they'd say, well, she was a poor girl from Nazareth. They wanted a connection with their girls, sure. yeah. their high school girls. So yeah, I think it was fun. They even, they even gave me the earrings they wanted. <laughs> and they wanted, um, the hardest one was the, the kilt. They wanted their their kilt, the girls, green and white. Yeah. yeah. So you see it there? Oh, yeah. I, 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 I didn't want to make it very prominent. Just, yeah. Yeah, it's stuck in the basket. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. Um, they also wanted a cardinal, the state bird, and they wanted the uh, dog one. They're not in there yet. Okay. At this point, but they're in there in the end. Do you see the cardinal? It's a female cardinal. I thought I was so clever. Oh. <laughs> All girls, but I didn't want to do the bright red. Right. Get you eye catching. So yeah. there's a female cardinal there near the yep. kilt. Yep. The donkey. Nice the donkey and the dog yeah. would love it. Yeah. Because they want it to be Oak Crest, you know, Vienna, Virginia. Yeah. Right. Activity. Right. And I, I used a cave down in Madison County. They have this little, it's not really a cave, it's more of an indentation, but I went and did studies at this, the paint on location to get the, the rocks. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's successful. I think what really helps is the dark behind the faces, mm -hmm. so the yes. light of the faces really come out. Mm -hmm. um, and then the girls, apparently, the two little lambs, apparently those heads could belong to either body. You see that? It could oh, be wrapped yeah. around okay. each other yeah. or yeah. bent. Oh, yeah. So kind of yeah. little, yeah. I didn't do that on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> but I like it. I should take that. And then the frame, a woodworker friend of mine made this frame. It's I think it's six inches wide and then a gold leaf the inner lip. But that's complicated, you know, to get the, sure. the wood yeah. and yeah. run through a machine that can carve at a, at a, on a curve. But really successful overall, I think. Um, and then I think the last slide is to see it in place with the wow. with the altar. So you mount your canvas to that frame that he can. Or how did you? Let's see. I um, I well, I, I build the I build the backboard out right. of MDF. Okay. With three quarter inch plywood mm -hmm. strips behind it, right. it's all solid. And then glue the canvas on top of that. Okay, then paint it. And then he came and um, took real close measurements. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of measurements. So it's it's a it's a it's a smooth half circle, so you can find the center and, and strike sure. an arch. Uh, but he did yeah, he did a great job and fit perfectly. Um, and you still have room for the angels. Yeah. Oh right, 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 right. Yes, I, I still want to do that. <laughs> So, so that is um, that's all about uh, the Boston School. My training. I do want to mention that 
And even, I'd like to spread the word that these ateliers are available and still going, like our, our daughter's going. And we need, we need good artists, uh, good Catholic artists, mm -hmm. to beautify our churches. And I do think that the architecture is changing. You know, we're getting more traditional mm -hmm. architecture, we'll need more traditional art to go in there. Yeah. So if you know anybody, I'd, I'd like to get the name Ingbertson out there and Cecil, and they have websites. So you can, and, and on Cecil's website, right on the front page, I recommend watching a six minute video. He was on the CBS Sunday Morning Show a few years ago. They did a very nice video of him, an interview. You can see the models and the painters and Charles there giving critiques, and the students walking back and forth. It's, it's really nice, well done to get a good taste for what this atelier system is like. So please spread that word if you would. Um, any questions about the training or, yes? Um, you know, I, I don't know much about the pricing of these sorts of things, but I imagine that it's still a cost prohibitive as it was back in the day. And I'm wondering if there's been, if there even is a possibility for some sort of middle ground to bring this sort of art to people that are maybe more middle class and don't have the thousands of dollars that it would normally take for something like this. Is there any developments in, in that? Well, prints, you know, um, prints are, can be very high quality nowadays and they don't cost much at all. And I just happen to have some. I could have planned that. Thank you. <laughs> no, but the, the church paintings do cost a lot. But, but the churches you know, can, can uh, do a fundraiser and get a little bit of money from a lot of people, and you've got, mm -hmm. you've got the bunch of thousand dollars. Yeah. My big commission for St. John the Baptist that will start next month and try to finish. Uh, by June 24th, his feast day, John the Baptist's feast day. Um, forgot, I lost my train of thought. Um, that's my big project. Oh, the, yeah, the, so I, that, that's our paycheck for six months. So we have seven children, they're going to Chelsea Academy, and you know, it's expensive. So um, I have to charge a lot. Uh, so, yeah, so, so prints, or then I end up with a lot of drawings that I sell. So that's one way. I usually have a show, and I'll, um, my wife has started framing. She frames really well. And so I like that drawing of Mary with the baby Jesus and the red chalk. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that, I sold that to somebody. So that's one way. Then the church ends up with a big painting. <clears throat> I do a lot of studies, so I have small studies. So I sell those. But I think prints probably are the, the best way to get art out there. Yes, sir. So when's the Madison School going to start? Uh, well, I do teach a little bit. I, um, just today I was teaching. Are you going to have an atelier? I don't think so. <laughs> um, I think uh, what I've done is just take one or two students mm -hmm. at a time. Um, so my daughter's been, been my student for, for a while. She's mm -hmm. now going off to Florence. But the plan is for her to come back and work with me so full time. We're running into, she's, she's She's dating somebody, and she's just starting talking about getting engaged. And my wife's saying, oh gosh, you've got to, there's a real potential here. She's, she's doing really well. You know, maybe don't, don't be in such a hurry. Try to get this good training in first. So that's, the, you know, just these last few days, we've been talking about that. Um, but we're thrilled that she's doing it. Um, so I, I think I'll just probably continue that. With, with, but I do feel, and Ingridson said that, he said, I feel sort of an obligation to pass on this training that yes. I got. Because yeah. it's so valuable, so good. So I do, well I teach at Chelsea Academy also, the, the high school. Okay. I teach there just three days a week, first period, so I can get down to my studio. So that's high schoolers. But, but actually for the first time <coughs> next year, I've had this, this girl as a, she's a senior now, draws very, very well, and she wants to pursue art right out of high school. So she's gonna come full time to my studio next year instead of going to college. So that's a first for me. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and I think she can do it. So next year it should be my daughter and this Olivia Zepeda young lady. Uh, I think so ten years from now we'll have other people coming and talking about how they learned their art at the Madison School. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> at Madison School. I hope so. So let me read you, because um, I kind of feel like I got off, I mean not, not, not off track, but wanted all that background 
And I started to say that thing about the two pillars, the, the craft, then the other pillar is the idea or the story, which he wants it to. Right. And you want to have that, of course. And I think, I think what happens with modern art is that the modern artists just concentrate on the message. Right. You know, and a lot of times the craft is, is not there at all. Um, so, so Gamble always said that. Be thinking about what you want to say. And he said, read good books, go to the plays, you know, listen to good music, because that will form you and, and give you ideas of what you want to say. And so as a Catholic, I love, I love trying to, to give glory to God through the beauty of nature. So the, the title that we came up with, I think, is very fitting. Um, uh, a vision of glory and how contemplating nature, the beauty of nature, can lead us to virtue and to God. And that makes me think of, of Gerard Manley Hopkins, the poet, who did that so, so well in his poetry. So I want to read The Windhover, is one of my favorite poems. <clears throat> the subtitle is To Christ Our Lord. And the Windhover, I had to look it up, is a uh, type of falcon. It's a, a bird of prey. So it is. I caught this morning, morning's minion, kingdom of daylight's dauphin, dapple dawn drawn falcon, in his riding of the rolling level, underneath him steady air, and striding high there, how he rung upon the rein of a wimpling wing, in his ecstasy, then off, off forth on swing. As a skate's heel sweep smooth on a bow bend, the hurl and gliding rebuffed the big wind. My heart in hiding stirred for a bird, the achieve of, the mastery of the thing. Brute beauty and valor and act, O oh, air, pride, plume, here buckle, and the fire that breaks from thee then, a billion times told lovelier, more dangerous, O oh, my chevalier. No wonder of it, sheer plod makes plow down silly and shine, and blue bleak embers, ah my dear, fall, gall themselves, and gash gold vermilion. So, I think that um, Gerard Manley Hopkins does what we're trying to do and uh, so beautifully. You know, Pie Beauty. <coughs> Pie Beauty is another of his uh, of his beauty of his poems, where the first line is "Glory be to God for dappled things." You probably heard that. And he lists all these these things that make him want to give glory to God for skies of couple color as a brinded cow, for rose moles all in stipple upon trout that swim, fresh fire coal, chestnut falls, finches wings. So that idea of of nature of being the subject of art, the subject of poetry, and I think and, and contemplating nature can lead us, lead us to God. And the very last thing is that there's a quote by um, Goethe, the, the playwright, the German poet and playwright, um, and his quote about um, encouraging people to see a fine picture, I think the book goes, I might have a slide of it, but paraphrase, it says, a person should see a fine picture, hear some good music, read a good poem every day of their lives in order that the daily grind does not kill the sense of the beautiful that God has implanted in our souls. So I think that's a, I mean, I, sometimes I've, I've um, give, and I give a little talk, I'll make copies of that. It's a good thing to put on your, Refrigerator to kind of remind you to read something good, see some, see something beautiful, and listen to some good music every day. So, thank you. <laughs> Answer any questions if you like, or maybe maybe do individual. Uh, what, what's best, David? What's going on? Does anybody have any questions or comments they would like to make at this point? Just Generally, well, yes, well, Henry, again, thank you for coming. It was such a pleasure um, to share this time with you. For those of us in the order who are, are both serving the poor and the sick and defending the faith, I'd just like to say to me personally, to have access to some of the beautiful images would be a great thing um, for our malaise. Have you ever thought about 
own things that are like within their um, their purview. Like they, they have an image of, of the Immaculate Conception that's particular to their community or they have other images of the Divine Mercy that they sell. Um, but but these are meant for, for private devotion. Um, and and I, we at the Order of Malta, I don't think we have anything like that that mm -hmm. would give us I'm a great admirer of your work. I actually love what you did for Father Harris and for Father oh. Hathaway. And there's one you didn't show that's the Basilica School of St. Mary Chapel that I'm very particular oh, oh, that's of. right. Yeah. yeah. Our Lady. So, but, you know, some of these things could actually help us in our evangelization. And we wouldn't, you know, want to diminish the originals, but to have good quality reclay prints would be a marvelous Right, and, and affordable. Well, um, I, haven't, I haven't really thought of that. I, um, I mostly concentrate on the originals and the studies that go into it, but, but lately I have made some prints, and there's a, a printing place in Front Royal that does good, good work. So I do have uh, a nice print of St. Therese, which I'd like to give, give to your order, give you, give you one. Um, well, I think it's a great idea, and you mentioned worth it before. Uh, maybe that's a great thing to have in their, in their house, something religious <clears throat> and beautiful. So I'd be interested in, in donating towards that cause, donating prints. Certainly. Well, that's I think idea. we'd like to support your work, too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that's a very good idea. Well, you know, we have particular devotion to our Lady of Lourdes. No, I didn't, I didn't realize that. Yeah. We do indeed. Okay, well, the picture you're talking about that Father Hathaway has at St. Mary's is, um, is somewhat of Our Lady of Lourdes. I think it has a, it a bit of a yellow rose on her foot, which is, seems very unusual. Uh, you know, interesting little thing that happened there. But uh, well, well, that makes me think of, I did go to Lourdes, and I went to the little, little tiny museum they had there, and they had images. Yeah. And one thing that struck out, stuck in my mind was, um, I think, I guess Bernard St. Bernadette tried to get several different artists to paint what she saw, mm -hmm. and each time she sort of shook her head and said, <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> you know, she seemed the most perfect, you know, the most perfect creation ever, Our Lady. Yeah. And finally, I think she gave up and said, oh, forget it. <laughs> yeah. You have to, have to go to heaven to see her. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so. Well, Faustina said the same thing. Is that right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, yeah. I think I remember that. She, when she had the artist try to do what she saw. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. yeah. Wasn't and then our Lord told her to stop. Yes. The order had a uh, fantastic painter, a knight, before he was kicked out because he murdered someone. <laughs> oh, Carvaggio. I remember he went to Malta. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness, yeah. He went to, went to Malta, then he went to Sicily, and vice versa. And yes. Um, you pointed out with the portrait of the, the newspaper man, just the different, the different details that subjects pick out. I was just wondering what the most common details someone might pick out. I mean, it's actually kind of interesting because when I think about it, <coughs> members of the Order of Malta might be some of the only people in the modern day that have actual ornaments that they might want on their person, as opposed to like uh, you know something that's not in an order of order of chivalry. I'm just wondering what the most common ones are, or what the most interesting one you experienced was. Well, yeah, I do. Th um, what is the emblem for our, of, of the Order of Malta? Is it a it's, 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 yeah, it's a cross? A cross. A cross. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I can think of some great Spanish. Um, Paintings, Velazquez, yes. uh, really beautiful <laughs> emblem. But today, well, unfortunately, you know, Sargent in the 19th century, or Van Dyke with that with that collar that went all the way around, mm -hmm. they had just such you know better clothing to work with. <laughs> <laughs> I have I have a very challenging commission coming up. This fellow in Winchester wants me to paint, wants me to paint an Appalachian Trail hiker meeting Jesus and Jesus washing his feet. Oh, wow. And I'm 
was thinking, do I really want to paint a, you know, an REI backpack? And, and <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know how to do that. <laughs> but uh, so do run into that. That, that brings up something interesting about beauty versus historical accuracy. And I think beauty should be the, the uh, trump card in that matter. So I use silk, because silk is just so beautiful. There's little mm -hmm. folds and ripples and the color changes in the shadows. You know. So Mary would not have had a silk dress <laughs> in Nazareth, but, but I, I, so in that nativity, she's in a rose-colored silk, which is just beautiful. So I think that I think the strength, you know, the, the 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 beautiful, the good, the true, trying to draw us in. A lot of times people will say, like Dostoevsky, I think he said, "Beauty will save the world." And a lot of times you hear people say that you know maybe the beauty will draw people into the church, and then you and then you you know learn the theology, learn the doctrine from there. Mm -hmm. So maybe beauty can be the first catch, or the first thing to catch somebody. So I think that's why I try with my still image. You know, there's, it's not there's no, it's not like a film where you have dialogue and cinematography and music and scenery. It's that still image. So I'm trying to make it as beautiful as I can. I think that's what's going to catch the person, draw them, draw them in. So that's a good question. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.